Welcome to this week's edition of It Is Chala Time. And today I do not have my colleague Tepo Kanama with me. He's actually on the way back from the National Road Freight for the Logistics Industries Bargaining Council. I want to do a bit of an educational today, a case that I'm currently busy dealing with. And it in essence deals with lawsuits that carries a certain amount of a risk to it. Whenever I go from employer to employer, almost on a daily basis, I will find that a lot of employers, you know, in some way or other, find that our labor laws are too stringent or, you know, um, they are struggling to survive, if I can put it that way. I remember last week, I believed the child at time. Do we really need these laws? And just again this week, I am so challenged as a HR consultant in at terms of advising clients and employers and I suppose employees also to an extent and trade unionists in terms of the legal requirements of how to deal with certain matters and then the pressures I experience when employers are starting to make demands. Now, when an employer deals with employees in context of a law, in context of a contract of employment or in context of a, a benefit or a policy that basically regulates to some extent, this employment relationship. It's remarkable to see how often, as we've always said, the conflict of interest between employer and employee are highlighted and amplified in this relationship. And often employers will ask me, but listen, can't we do this in a different way? Or, you know, when it comes to dismissal disputes, oh, can't we dismiss now? And we need to try to give an advice and guidance and counsel on how to follow the correct process and employers can so often get impatient. And then we typically tell employers, listen, I understand that you need to manage the business and understand that the business needs to operate. But also when it comes to dispute resolution, if it is found that you are wanting from a fairness perspective or in the way that you complied with laws from a procedural perspective, there are certain risks that is associated with that conduct of yours, that act or omission, if I can put it that way. And some issues carries with it a very low risk. Some issues carries with it a very high risk. As an example, some employers let employees work more than the required 10 hours over time per week, maybe 11 hours or 12 hours, a very low risk, as long as you pay the staff. If you don't pay staff, high risk. But today I want to deal specifically with, with risk in terms of when we charge an employee for misconduct, but the real nature of this dispute really relates to incapacity. Now, we are currently dealing with a case whereby a certain manager committed gross misconduct and the employee was subsequently charged and we actually chairperson has been the chairperson of this inquiry. And yes, the employer wants to know, can't we dismiss, how long is this going to take still? But in this case, this employee submitted a, psych a report from a psychologist basically stating that he had a stroke and they actually submitted brain scans of this employee clearly showing how his healthy brain looked like versus how it looks like now and the healthy brain is clearly white as it should be and the um the the the, the, the picture of or the image of the brain after he had the stroke clearly could see it's very dark and you could clearly see he's not well in addition to the report they further and continued stating that you know, because of the stroke, he's now suffering from personality changes. You know, his cognitive abilities are impaired. His ability to make good decisions are also being impacted and impaired due to his stroke. But immediately, we had to advise the employer, listen, we probably need to venture and explore converting this misconduct process into an incapacity process. And let me explain from a risk perspective. You know, when it comes to normal unfair dismissals, maybe in terms of performance or let's say misconduct. You know, in addition to, you know, in some circumstances an employee being reinstated, an employee can also be compensated and maximum compensation is up to 12 months of a salary. But when it comes to this one issue of, you know, dealing with a matter of incapacity whereby an employee had been dismissed for misconduct, but he was actually incapacitated. 
This becomes an automatic unfair dismissal in terms of Section 187 of the Labor Relations Act because this dismissal is related to the disability of the person. And then simultaneously, there's also the possibility of the employer having committed unfair discrimination in terms of Section 6 of the Employment Equity Act, whereby an employer may potentially have discriminated against a person against, once again, a disability. In terms of the Employment Equity Act, there's no limitation to compensation, and one will typically look at to what level and extent the human dignity of the employee had been tarnished because of a dismissal. And this is where you tell the employer, listen, hold on, let's wait, be patient, let's investigate incapacity, let's explore this. Because if we mess up on this element or this aspect, it can literally cost millions. <laughs> so we need to be very careful that when we do misconduct hearings and it seems like a matter the real issue here, the underlying issue, may actually relate to incapacity. We need to be careful. We need to start asking the right questions. And step number one is to calm the employer down and say, listen, we're not saying we're not going to dismiss for misconduct. What we are saying is that we need to investigate incapacity and explore whether that is the real issue here. Now, I'm taking guidance from a case, Janssen versus Legal Aid South Africa, um, 16 May 2018, where this employee was also dismissed for misconduct. And once you look at what the employee had been charged for, we all probably would have dismissed this employee for misconduct. It's quite gross misconduct. Severe forms of insubordination and gross insolence and so forth. But this chairperson that was appointed to deal with the actual inquiry she was a bit narrowly focused in that she only dealt, in her view, with the misconduct issue. At the later stage, I believe after the hearing, but before the report came out, the employee did submit reports that indicates his incapacity and so forth. And the employer continued and said, listen, you did not have the information at the time of the inquiry. Therefore, we will just continue with the misconduct process. But not so. The Labor Court eventually ruled that this was an unfair dismissal because it is a requirement of every decision maker, whether you are a chairperson or a commissioner at the CCMA or whether you are a judge at the Labour Court, you need to identify and deal with the real nature of the dispute. They should have dealt with the matter in terms of incapacity. In that case, the court basically stated that what we are looking for is not just any form of depression. Young Mr. Janssen was suffering from severe forms of depression. We're not talking about every employee now saying I'm depressed and therefore I cannot be held accountable for my conduct. Okay, That's what we're saying. The courts are saying if that were to be so, nobody can be held accountable probably because I suppose in some way or other we all suffer. Every South African suffer from depression in some form you know, or extent. That is not what they're saying. But what they are basically saying is that certain forms of mental illnesses and depression impairs a person's cognitive and cognitive abilities to such an extent that they can't actually be held accountable for their own conduct. So what it basically means is your ability to perceive data and information through your senses, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your ears, and I suppose your skin and so forth, and your ability to respond to those senses or that data in a normal and reasonable way like an everyday person would. For some people with mental illnesses or incapacities relating to depression or so forth, it's so severe that they can't actually be held accountable for their own actions. And that seems to have been the case with the Labour Court stated here in Mr. Janssen versus Legal Aid. And therefore, he could not have been held responsible for his misconduct. And therefore, they could not have dealt with the matter in terms of misconduct. So, but yeah, it is important for us as chair people, decision makers, to correctly identify the real nature of the dispute. And if you are dealing with incapacity issue, I want to warn you, and you need to warn your client or the employer, let's start asking the right questions. Let us not fall for the pressure of just putting it under the carpet and just continue with the misconduct. I'm not saying ultimately you can't, but I am saying that you should investigate incapacity issues. So yeah, that's for this week, short and to the point. Um, we are dealing with a case like this at the moment and it is important, you know, that employers just back down a bit and are patient and it's not asking the right questions. Because at the end of the day, if a person is not able to perform due to their incapacity, you know, we need to 
also assist an employee in context of what the legal requirements are. Anyway, that's all for this week. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your week and the weekend that's coming. And see you next time on It Is Charlotte Time. And don't forget to like and to subscribe. Thank you.